thank you for listening to this message from Waynesboro Free Methodist Church. Our mission is to multiply faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We hope this message helps you along your journey. Good morning, everyone. My name's Freddie Batten, and I'm reading the scripture this morning, John 5, 18 to 30. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but even, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus replied, I truly tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And just as the father raises his head and gives them life, so the son also gives life to whom he wants. The father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, so that all people may honor the son just as they honor the father. Anyone who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but be passed from death to life. I truly tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and, and those who hear, who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also has he granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but to those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Freddie. You don't need this. I don't appreciate it. Good morning, church family. How are we? Yeah. Guys, I am excited to teach this text to you. Uh, your head's probably hurting, though, after hearing that, because uh, it is a deep text. But before we get to it, uh, if you didn't turn your Bibles yet, go ahead and open them, because, boy, are we going to be dancing around in this passage all morning. John 5, verse 18 through 30. Uh, And as you're turning there, just want to celebrate the fact that it is turned fall. We are in fall season, and all of you, most of you, are rocking that sweater weather, right? And uh, I love the flannel weather. I uh, break out my flannels anytime it's fall, and I enjoy them thoroughly. Others of you are, uh, could care less about the fact that it's fall. You care more about the fact that there is a potluck awaiting us after this service, and you're just saying, Scott, you better not take more than 10 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. This text is too complicated and too in-depth to just sweep through it in 10 minutes, but my stomach is growling, and if I hear some rumblings, not from your mouth, from your stomachs, I'll know it's time to, to move along. But uh, guys, if you uh, were paying attention to what Freddie read so well, uh, y- you already can tell that there's a certainty about the passage today, that this passage is all about Jesus and hardly about you. <laughs> it's all about Jesus and it's hardly about you. And, and so like there's some concerns that I have with that, but I'll get to that in a moment. Like this text, it's deeply theological, isn't it? It's uh, theology meaning the, 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 the study of God, right, in the Greek, or the word of God, word on God almost in the Greek. And so today's text deals a lot with what we call in the field of theology Christology, Christology, the, the study of the Christ. In other words, it's studying the person, the nature, and the work of the Christ, of Jesus. So I, I just want to ask, um, 
Just a show of hands, how many of you's favorite passage of Scripture in all of the Bible can be found in John 5, 18 through 30? How many of you have a favorite passage from there? I see one hand. Yeah, this is not very, uh, a, a very favorited passage. It's not like you see these verses on coffee mugs and t-shirts uh, because they're really in-depth. It's, in fact, it's kind of mind-blowing. Like you were reading it, and he's like, oh, I don't do anything on my own will, but I do the will of the Father, and like, I don't do, like the Father's given life to me. And it's like, what? Oh, wow, that, that's a lot. That's discombobulating in a way. Your head might already be hurting a little bit. Now, here's a belief that I have. I believe that all truth is entertaining. I believe that it's true, it holds my attention. But I have a fear this morning. Uh, I have a fear um, that this text uh, won't be entertaining enough for some of us. And that, um, that we might tune out and start thinking about the potluck and what we're going to be putting all on our plates. Or we might be thinking about the game that's going to be on the TV later today. I fear it might not be entertaining enough for some of us. I also fear that uh, as you read through it, you were kind of like, well, what's in this for me? How do I apply this text to my own life? What can I take away from this? Guys, as pastors, a lot of the ways that we approach application to texts is to ask questions that, like Pastor Ethan mentioned a few weeks ago when he talked about Josiah's life uh, and talked about Specca, right? Is there a sin to avoid here? Not explicitly. Is there a, a, a promise to keep? Yeah, I see one. Is there an example to follow? Well, you, know, you can't really claim deity with Christ, uh, can't follow that example. Is there, is there a command to obey? No, there's no command or imperative in this text, so my goodness, uh, how are we going to land this passage into our lives? What's in this for me, you might be wondering. Well, uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, every now and then when I go to uh, study a passage of Scripture, sometimes I'll tune into some random dude's sermon, whether it's on YouTube or a podcast. And I was listening to a pastor up in Vancouver, Canada, teach this passage. And the application of this passage, he said, fathers, be better dads. I was like, what? Is that, that the subject of the text? Is that what he's even after? I actually, I was in the car and I yelled at my radio. I said, that's how you're applying this? And the, nobody in the car agreed with me. It was unfortunate because nobody was in there. But anyways, so, so like I'm going to refuse to try to apply this text by stretching it out into ways that it's just not intended to go. All right, so let's just let the text do the text because the essence of this text is actually of first importance in our faith. The essence of this text is expounding on the nature of Jesus' equality with God. It's expounding on Jesus' claims that He is equal to God, or at least what the Jewish leaders understood Him to be saying. So this is about Jesus' divinity. It's about the nature of His God-likeness. It's like, We're asking exactly, like, what kind of relationship does the Son have with the Father? That's the nature of this text. What kind of relationship does the Son have with the Father? Which means we're dealing with a really debated issue throughout all of time and throughout all of cultures, all of history. We were dealing with the hotly debated topic of the millennias in the last 2,000 years. The most debated question of who Jesus was. Exactly who was he, right? So, so this is of first importance because historians would say, no, he was just a really nice man. Some historians would say he's a political revolutionary, right? Uh, you might have some atheists who would say that he's a, he was a moral teacher. He taught some good morals. Uh, you'd have Buddhists who would say that he's a holy man who taught truth and he was a wise teacher. You have Muslims who would even agree that he is a prophet to be revered, according to the Quran, Surah 6. You have Hindus who say that Jesus is probably a god, but among many gods. You have Jews who would say that he was a a teacher and he worked miracles, although they would actually say in some of their uh, language, they'd say actually that Jesus was working magic. He was a magician. Well, guys, we're dealing with a really hotly debated topic today. 
about the nature of Jesus' divinity. And not only are we dealing with a debated topic, we're, de- de- we're dealing with the distinctive claim of Christianity. We're dealing with the very thing that makes you and I Christian. The chief claim of Christians is that Jesus was u- and is uniquely God, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, co-creator of the universe, was preeminent and pre-existent before all time and space and matter were in existence. So like, when I say that this is the chief claim above all, in other words, if you don't believe Jesus is God, then you're not a Christian. Like we're dealing with the chief claim of Christianity. The thing that makes us exclusively different from everyone else. Jesus' divinity. You see, there are people out there who would even say that Jesus himself never claimed to be God. Jesus never said, I am God. Right Now, you and I could already look back at the first three or four chapters of the book of John and be like, oh, you're wrong. Here's why. He claimed to be the Messiah. He told this, right? Like, it's just ridiculous that they say that. Um, one example would be, do you guys remember the, the book or the movie, The Da Vinci Code? You guys remember that? Remember when that came out and how much the church freaked out, right? Like, I remember, I was, a, I was probably, I, I can't remember, maybe middle school or high school. And this book came out by Dan Brown, and then the movie came out, and then all, the, all we Christians were really concerned about how we need to defend our faith against these claims. And really, the easiest one was just simply, it's a fiction book. <laughs> Somebody made it up. But anyways, like... The point of that book was to show that Jesus wasn't divine, that he was human, that he had married Mary Magdalene and had kids, and that the divinity of Christ was actually a fabricated piece of theology 300 years after his life because Constantine thought it would be better for the the chief character to be a demigod, and so it's just ridiculous that this book carried its weight, but we're dealing with the divinity of Christ here, and it's been hotly debated. It's been the chief distinctive issue And here we have a passage that's expounding exactly on that. It expounds on Jesus' unique equality with the Father. So, in other words, you and I, we can't afford to tune out on this. We can't afford to start daydreaming. We have to have this part right, because if we don't have Jesus as God, then we have nothing If we do not believe that Jesus is God, if he was not God, then we have nothing. So it's of first importance what we're talking about today. It's primarily essential as you might describe it. So don't ignore the text. Stay trained on this passage. It's essential. So with that, let me try to recall where we're at in the story because there's some scenes that set this up and help build up the understanding of what all is going on here. you got to remember that just in the beginning of this chapter, Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda, and he healed a man who had been lame uh, for 38 years, paralyzed, who was trying to use the pool to heal himself, but Jesus comes in, makes him entirely well. The man gets up, takes up his mat, and walks, and the Jewish leaders who had been tending to the invalids for who knows how many years, and probably even knew this guy, he got up and got healed, and, and, and are they amazed? No, they're like, why are you breaking our laws? Like, again, how dull, right? Well, so they, they, the guy says, somebody told me. They said, who? He said, I don't know. Then they find out that it's Jesus. And so now these Jewish leaders are mad that Jesus told this guy to get up and take up his mat and walk in order to break the Sabbath law. But then Jesus responds with something that's super, super simple. My father is working now, and so I am working. In other words, God doesn't stop actually holding the universe together on the Sabbath day, once a week. So he continues to work, so the sons can continue to work. And then we got to verse 18 last week, and we found out that the Jews not only wanted to kill him because he was breaking Sabbath law, but we found out that they wanted to kill him because he was saying that God was his father, which they understood to mean that he was claiming to be equal with God to be equal with God. And then we get to verse 19. That's our starting kind of text for today. Verse 19, and there's a word that's missing there, 
that is for, for Bible study implications of most importance for understanding this. It's the word therefore, right? Your translation probably doesn't have it, but it's in the Greek. In other words, we need to make sure we're understanding that everything Jesus says from verse 19 all the way down to verse 47 is in response to the Jewish leaders' hatred and persecution because Jesus was claiming to be God. So therefore, Jesus responds. And did you notice the nature of his response when Freddie was reading it? Did you notice how he responds? Does, does he kind of retract his statement? He's like, oh, whoa, whoa, you guys got that all wrong. No, 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 I, let me correct you. Does he, does he turn into a, 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 like a polite Canadian and say, oh, sorry, sorry, I, it's uh, my bad. Uh, don't you know? I can fix this. No, he doesn't, he doesn't, does he try to start finding commonalities between their two beliefs? Well, you, so are you agreed on this? Well, I'll agree on this, right? So maybe we can share that, right? Does he do that? No, no. In response to the, 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 their hatred and their persecution, he doesn't get all sensitive. He doesn't get all apologetic. He doesn't retract his statement. He doesn't correct them. He doubles down. And he explains exactly what it means that he is equal with the Father. He expounds on this equality. And in his response, guys, it was a labor to try to do this, to, to, to kind of make this essential into three, or like show the three essential claims that Jesus is making in his response. Because there's three in response to this. He says, first, I imitate the Father. Right? That's just whittled down. Second, I give life. And third, I make judgment. So if you have notes and you're writing them, you can outline your text with those three claims. First, that Jesus imitates the Father. Jesus is saying, I imitate the Father. It's what starts and finishes the passage. So if you can read back through verses 19 and 20, check this out. Therefore, Jesus replied to them, Truly, I tell you, the Son is not able to do anything of his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son likewise does these things. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing, and he will show him greater works than these. Stop there, and then jump down to verse 30. Look at that. Look at verse 30. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So we've got this Jesus bookending kind of his main line of thought with this implication that his actions and his will are equal to God's. That his action and his will are equal in their identity to the Father. In fact, this is kind of what it means to be equal with God. Jesus is copying the Father. Now, that's not that annoying game that kids play that they repeat everything you say and it just gets super frustrating because then they say, stop copying. Yeah, stop copying me, right? Like, this is not that stupid game. This is Jesus paying attention to his Father and doing what the Father does. So commentator B.F. Westcott, he put it this way, perfect sonship involved perfect identity and will and action with the Father. Perfect sonship involves perfect identity of will and action with the Father. So there's this beautiful picture that Jesus is actually painting here, one you might be quite familiar with. It's the picture of apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. So uh, just by show of hands, how many of you as children were kind of taught a trade by your mom or your dad that would then uh, allow you to maybe take over the business that they had or equip you for future work that you were going to be doing in that same field? How many of you had that, right? So, so it was kind of like an apprentice setup, right? Guys, this is, this is a really beautiful picture. So my older brother, Kyle, uh, I'm the youngest of four boys, uh, the third one, or the second one, he uh, just recently opened up his own business, started his own business out of sales, and now he's uh, a, a home handyman, right, uh, down in Charlotte, South Charlotte handyman. Excellent uh, quality of work and ethic. Uh, but if you go to his website, uh, you can see why he feels qualified to do what he does as a handyman. And this is what he says. He says, I grew up learning how to take care of homes from a young age with my dad. Because you see, my dad would do things 
uh, that would show us his love for us uh, and equipping us for things. He would, uh, he would bring us under the car as he would change the oil and show us the uh, oil plug and the drain pan and show us the oil filter and how to change it out properly and what to take out and what to put back in so that it still works when you're done. He would take us under the sink and he would show us how to fix the leak with the pipe wrench. He would take us into the garage and hand us the drill as we fashioned our own bike rack for our garage because we had six bikes in one garage. So we needed a way to store them, right? He would slide over the keyboard to us uh, so that we could learn how to budget like he budgets our, his finances. You see, he'd show us what he was doing and then he'd give us the space to do it with him. Guys, most cultures around the world throughout history have this same understanding of the father and mother to the son or the daughter, right? They have this, uh, this desire to teach their kids their trade, to, to pass along their skills, whether it's in masonry or uh, engineering or cooking or finances or fabrics or sewing or anything. Like, like y- you know why? Because most kids around the world didn't have access to career day at school, Right? Their career, they, it, it, all they had access to was what their parents had access to. And so fathers and mothers would very intently pass along their skill and trade to their children. And you know it's got to be defined by some characteristic because as a father, like when I bring my kids into the garage and we're working on something, it's so much easier for me to just do it myself. I'd rather just do it myself. But there's got to be something that defines the patience to be able to put up with the waiting and the, and the, and the intricate involvement. No, let me show you this. And the possibility of mistakes with our kids. And it was love. In fact, Jesus says here why the Father shows him the works that he's doing. Because he loves the Son. Verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. You see, the father gently, graciously in this apprenticeship would lovingly equip the son with these skills and these trades. We can see that in Jesus' life on earth. We saw it with his father, Joseph, right? Jesus, by trade, was a what? A carpenter, right? Because his daddy was a carpenter. Joseph was an excellent craftsman with wood, and so he taught that trade to his own son, and Jesus himself was also a carpenter. But we also understand that Jesus had a heavenly father, and he was paying attention to his dad in heaven, and his dad was showing him the works of the kingdom, and he was obeying and imitating them. You see, the father shows the love that he has for the son and showing him the works that he's doing and bringing the son into them. And the son shows his love for the father in the sense that he's paying attention and he's lovingly obeying all that the father is showing him to do. And in copying his father, in imitating the father, he reveals the nature of the father. He's not trying to eclipse the Father so that people see only Jesus and not God. He's not trying to diminish the Father and bring him down. No, he's just, here's the Father. Here's what he's like. So when we're talking about Jesus' equality with God and Jesus describing it, the first thing he says is that he imitates the Father. He copies God in what he does in action and in will. So that's the first claim. The second claim that Jesus makes in response to the Jews' hatred and persecution uh, is pretty scandalous. And that was this, that Jesus gives life. Can you say that? One, two, three. Jesus gives life. I am actually behind on my notes. There we go. Ba-ba! Then we get to verse 21. Check out verse 21. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom He wants. Guys, uh, just, I don't know if you're aware of this, there is a passionately held belief in monotheistic Judaism. You know what it is? That only God gives life. That only God is the one who actually has life within him and can give it to other people. And you can track that conviction throughout all the Old Testament. I mean, just starting in Genesis 2-7, it says, Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed, 
the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. You can see it in Job 33. As he's processing through his great grief, he says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of God Almighty gives me life. You can see the psalmist write about it in Psalm 36. For the wellspring of life, the fountain of life, is with you, God. It's not out in the world somewhere where Indiana Jones has to go discover it. No. By means of your light, we see light. We also see it in Deuteronomy 32. See now, this is God talking, see now that I alone am he, there is no God but me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can rescue anyone from my power. So guys, there's this very clear prerogative in Scripture, a very clear belief that the the prerogative and the power to give life was God's alone in Jewish understanding. It was only God's. And yet here we have a guy named Jesus saying, I am able. I have life within me, and I am able to give life to whoever I choose. Huh. That's pretty scandalous. In this context, especially as he's trying to defend or come against or talk to the Jews who hated him because he was saying he was equal with God. He's saying, yeah, 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 you're right. I can give life. That thing only God can do, I can do it too, right? Guys, humanity is a derived creature. We get our existence from God. We get our ability to sustain life from God and through eating and drinking, right? Without those things, like Joseph was saying, we can't survive. But Jesus has life within himself, and he needs nothing. He can lay his own life down, and he can pick it back up again as he so chooses. He can give life to whoever he desires. Look at verse 25 and 26. Verse 25, Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. Guys, did you notice that the life-giving of Jesus isn't just waiting for us to die? That it actually is here now? It's not waiting for us at the end of the age? Guys, Jesus is saying, uh, not only does he give physical life, but he gives spiritual life. He is able to wake us up from death spiritually. And he says that we have now, we can have now eternal life. You know why he says that? Because eternal life isn't just simply living in heaven for the rest of eternity. The way Jesus describes eternal life in John 17, verse 3, he says, and this is eternal life, knowing you, God, and knowing the one you have sent. In other words, you and I, we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, right? We were living, but we were not alive. We didn't know God, and yet Jesus makes us alive. He raises our souls up from death, and that's just a down payment to show us what is coming at the end of the age. But Jesus has this ability to raise the dead spiritually, Not only that, but he can do it physically too, and he proved it, right? Guys, there are, uh, in the book of John, John only records in detail seven miracles of Jesus. Seven signs are what they've called. We've looked at three of them so far, turning the water into wine, healing the royal official's son, and then healing the lame man by the pool, right? Three. The seventh one, do you know what it is? Raising Lazarus from the dead. Raising Lazarus. Lazarus from the dead after he had been in the tomb for four days. Remember how Jesus said, and greater works he will show the Son in verse 20? Greater works than these? He raised a guy from the dead. You think he can also raise our souls? <laughs> right? This is, this is the evidence for this, right? And you know why he said he would do it? He says he will show him greater works than these. Verse 20, so that you will be amazed so that you would marvel. Guys, and this isn't just simply like an audience's astonishment at a magician's cheap tricks up on the stage. right? When he says that you would marvel, it means that you would be so in awe that you would have to deal with this. You can't just put it off and ignore it. right? It's so amazing 
It has to be instrumental. And not only is this characterizing Jesus' life and ministry in this very text at this moment in history, but he's also talking about what he means when he gives life at the end of the age. you notice that? Verse 28. Do not be amazed at this, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. This might actually put some of you off for a second. Because you have been taught your whole life that at the end of the age, only Christians are raised from the dead. But Jesus is saying here that all people will come out of their graves. Every person. Not just believers. Not just believers like Billy Graham or Charles Spurgeon or Whitfield or Wesley or, Cle- uh, or like Amy Carmichael or Corey Ten Boone or, or Calvin or Arminius or Peter or James or John or Stephen. No, no, no. They will come out of their grave, but also non-believers too. People who wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Like Kobe Bryant or Michael Jackson or maybe Queen Elizabeth, one of the older ones, or Osama bin Laden, or Cleopatra, or Frederick Nietzsche, or Kim Jong-il, or Leonardo da Vinci, or, or Julius Caesar, all of them will come out of the grave. Revelation 20 describes that, that all people, great and small, will come out of their graves, whether it's on land or in the sea, and they will come before the great white throne and stand trial before a judge. And that actually connects us to Jesus' third scandalous claim in this passage. Because not only does Jesus imitate the Father, not only does Jesus give life, but He also makes judgment. Can you say this with me? One, two, three. Jesus makes judgment. Look at verse 22. I told you, we're dancing in this text, aren't we? Your feet might be hurting after this. Verse 22, the Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. It's given it to the Son. So guess what else is a deeply, passionately held belief in monotheistic Judaism? Not only is God the only one who gives life, but here... God is the only one who judges. God is the only one who will ever make judgment. You can track that through the Old Testament as well. We see Abraham in Genesis 18 and pleading with God for the sake of Sodom and Gomorrah. Won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? Uh, We see it in Psalm 50 verse 6. The heavens proclaim his righteousness for God is the judge. Guys, and there's multiple psalms that say the same thing, that the Lord God is the judge. You can see Psalm 96, verse 13. The Lord is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness. So, like, it's making sense. Like, the Jews believe God is the only one who makes judgment over all the earth. And yet, here we got this guy named Jesus who says, well, actually, like, the Father judges No one, I, have been given the right to judge. That's pretty scandalous again. Like, if you thought Jesus was kind of like pulling his punches, you think again, right? You know, he's landing them. And if, you, and, and, and if there's one that's like a KO punch, anything that kind of knocks out the opponent, it's verse 27. Look at it, verse 27. And the Father has granted the Son the right to pass judgment because the Son is the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Guys, that is a key phrase. Some of you think, or maybe you might think that the words, the Son of God, is the claim of deity. That's not it. Uh, That's actually a more common phrase among Jews. Some Jews believe that we're all sons of gods in that sense. But here we have Jesus declaring Himself to be the Son of Man. And that is much more scandalous than Him saying, I am the Son of God. This is an allusion here to the apocalyptic Son of Man that's seen in Daniel 7. So again, I would make sure you're writing your notes because this is important. Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14. This is the prophecy in Daniel. Suddenly one like a Son of Man 
was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is God, and was escorted before Him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So Jesus, not only you saw it earlier, He is the Son of God in verse 25, but He's also the Son of Man. And because He is the Son of Man, He has been given the right to judge. You know that one thing that Jews said only God can do? Make judgment? So, so why would God give Jesus this right? Why would God give judgment of all of creation to the Son? Why would the Father do that? Well, he explains it in verse 22 and 23. The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is beautiful. This is the Father saying, no, not me, the Son. And this is the Son saying, no, 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 not me, the Father. And this is the Spirit saying, no, 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 not me, the Father and the Son, right? We have God wanting to glorify each person of the triune Godhead. And here we see the Father wanting the Son to be honored just as He is honored. And so He gives Jesus all judgment So Jesus not only gives life, but he also makes judgment in this text. And you saw how that lands at the end of the age. Look back again at verse 28 and 29. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done wicked or done good things to the resurrection of life, but to those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation, or the Greek word again is judgment. This is the judge making a sentence. This is him sentencing people, making a judgment. And Jesus makes it binary. There's two options, two sentences to receive for all who would ever or will ever exist. Two sentences. One would be if you do good, you're raised to the resurrection of life. If you do wicked, you're raised to the resurrection of judgment or condemnation, which would be eternal separation from the delight of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, some of you might be hearing that and be like, wait, 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 wait. Just a few weeks ago, we talked about how we're, we're, we're saved by faith alone. What is Jesus doing saying when he says you've got to do good works in order to be raised to eternal life? Well, that's how we're going to apply the text. That's how we're going to land the text today. Guys, remember how I said there's not really a command to obey here? There's no imperative in this passage. There's there's, uh, no real example that we can truly follow because we, again, can't claim equality with God like Jesus did. And we might be able to say, oh, well, imitate the Father as Jesus imitates the Father, right? Great, sure, but that's not the point of the text. There's also no sin to avoid explicitly stated. But you know what there is? There's a promise. There's one promise of a present and a future reality, and all the text hinges on this one verse, verse 24. You better look at it. You better highlight it. You better mark that thing up. Truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me, which is the Father, he just said that in verse 24, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. One key thing here, he says, anyone who hears my logos, my word, singular, he's not just pointing back to a single word in a sentence, he's actually pointing to his message. Anyone who hears my message and responds with believing in the Father who sent me, there's this promise. This promise that that right now, in believing, the moment that you believe, you receive eternal life. You have, at that moment, passed 
from death into life and you will escape the future judgment that's coming. So when Jesus says those who have done good are raised to the resurrection of life, in this gospel, doing good is believing the one who sent Jesus, is believing in the one God sent into this world. And the ultimate evil, the ultimate wickedness, according to the gospel of John, is to refuse to believe in Jesus is to refuse to believe what he declares to be true about himself and the nature of his relationship with his Abba. So, so the greatest good that you and I can do in, in, in order to receive the eternal life, the resurrection to life, is to believe what Jesus said, to believe that he imitates the Father and in doing so he reveals the nature of the Father. It is to believe that Jesus is the one who gives life and has life within himself, that all life starts with him and any spiritual life is initiated by him. And that's something only God can do to, to, to also that we would believe that Jesus makes judgment over all of creation. Again, that's only something God can do. This is, this is the kind of belief that believes that anyone who has seen Jesus has seen the Father, just like he said. It's the kind of belief that says, yeah, yeah, Jesus is equal with God. Yeah, I agree. He is God. Anything less than that misses it all entirely. Guys, we can't afford to accept anything less than this. We just can't. You can't pick and choose which parts of Jesus' logos, which part of his word you want to believe, and then say, well, nope, that part, nope, I'm not going to accept that. You can't. Accept some and reject all. You can't accept anything less than Jesus' chief claim that he is equal with God. Guys, there was a, a, a contemporary of Billy Graham. I don't know if you know this guy. His name's Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was uh, an ex, he, he used to be an evangelist, would preach the gospel. Many were saved as they heard him preach, but then he started having trouble reconciling the sufferings in the world with the goodness of God, and so he eventually abandoned his faith, left it all, walked away, and he refused Jesus' deity. He refused that Jesus was God. But he would say this about Jesus. He would say, uh, oh, Jesus is the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was the intrinsically wisest person that I've ever encountered in my life or reading, readings. He's the most important thing in my life. And yet he won't accept that Jesus says he is God. You know, uh, about a year ago, our church... I got a notice in our email saying that our church on Google had received a five-star review. That's incredible, right? Good things. You know why we got a five-star review from this guy? He said, great parking. <laughs> he, he gave us five stars. He's a, he approved of us fully. He says, man, they're most excellent. They get a five-star review because of their parking. You think that misses something? You think that misses what's going on here? What happens among us as we relate to one another, the ministry that God's doing in the community through this church? You think he missed it? You can't give us a five-star review and say our parking is great when the whole mission of our church is to multiply faithful followers of Jesus Christ. If we're doing that, then give us five stars on that. You can't do the same thing with Jesus. You can't say, oh, he's got five stars in my book. He's a great moral teacher. He's a really good guy. Uh, but he wasn't God because Jesus said he is God. You can't lift Jesus up as a wise, sound, moral teacher or a prophet and then hear these words and understand the context and then say, nope, he didn't say to be God. You know, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, if you haven't read that book, I would commend it to you. He says this, and I'll, I'll just put it up on the screen for you. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish things that people often say about Jesus. Oh, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. 
a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, (laughs) or else he would be the devil of hell himself, a liar, a deceiver, right? You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. Three claims Jesus makes. I imitate the Father perfectly. I have and give life just as the Father does. And I make judgment just as the Father does. Accept it all as true or accept none of it. So my plea with you this morning My plea is to believe, is to hear this message and to respond with believing, to be convinced that this is true, that this is the reality of Jesus, and that you would in turn fall at Jesus' feet and call him Lord and God, to, to in this moment be understanding, yeah, oh, wow, really, I, I actually, I'm now getting this. Jesus really is God. And in that moment, you receive eternal life. You pass from death into life, and you escape judgment that's coming. Why wouldn't we believe this? Only here can we find hope. Only here can we find life. And only here can we find escape from the coming judgment. We hope this message helps you multiply faithful followers of Jesus Christ. For more information about our church, please visit waynesboroughfm.com.